Hi, I'm Mike Sandifer with Northwest School of Fly Fishing. Coming up is Fly Fishing Strategies for the South Fork Boise River. Northwest School of Fly Fishing Virtual Fly Fishing Academy. Your number one resource for fly fishing education and knowledge. Hi, I'm Mike Sandifer with Northwest School of Fly Fishing Virtual Fly Fishing Academy. And today I'm here to talk to you a little bit about uh, the South Fork Boise River how we fish it, how we in particular nymph fish it. There's are certain strategies and techniques that we use on uh, the South Fork Boise River. But first we've got to talk a little bit about where it is. So uh, most folks that uh, have been in, in the Boise or the Treasure Valley area for a long time have no uh, need to know where it is. But for, for some of the folks that are out there that have never fished it or only fished it a few times, is, is basically you want to go east from the Treasure Valley to Mountain Home and then at Mountain Home you want to take Highway 20 exit and then you want to go uh, towards uh, Sun Valley, Ketchum area and you want to go about 20 miles and then you're going to exit. There's two exits. You can take Prairie Road or you can take the Anderson Ranch Dam Road and that'll take you right down to the river. Now the South Fork of the Boise River that we're talking about today is a tailwater river. That means it's a, a river born from the bottom of a dam. So essentially the South Fork of the Boise River uh, starts at Anderson Ranch Reservoir Dam and then it flows all the way into Arrow Rock Reservoir. And in particular the, the, the places that we're talking about today are really from the dam uh, about 14 or 15 miles down to the last access to the river at Danskin Bridge. Uh, so that's a lot of river to fish and it's all a uh, big wide gravel road and uh, you have full access to the river that, that entire length and it gives you really an opportunity to really read the water a little bit. So historically the South Fork of the Boise River uh, has been one of the finest um, tailwater for rainbow trout in the northwest for generations and in particular I've been fishing it uh, going on 30 years and it's always been a solid producer for the nymph fishermen. Uh, the neat thing about the South Fork Boise River is that it offers a variety, a variety of fishing from dry fly fishing to streamer fishing and, and, and especially uh, 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 nymph fishing. And what we really want to talk today about is the strategies and techniques of nymph fishing that river and how uh, successful anglers uh, really do that. Uh, you can find stretches of the water from the dam all the way down. I mean, there's, there's some occasions when you don't even get much more than a mile down from the dam and the fishing would be so good. Uh, the, the trout in the South Fork Boise River are quite large and we're going to talk specifically in one of our sessions exactly how we catch those big rainbow trout. Uh, the thing you got to remember about the South Fork Boise River, it's not fished the same way all the time. Uh, there's seasons on the South Fork Boise River. The South Fork Boise River uh, is open 10 months of the year and they close it two months of the year for the spawn. So I think it, it yeah, end of, end of March, April, all the way to the uh, Saturday of Memorial Day weekend it is closed for the, for the spawn. But aside from that, you can fish it uh, uh, the rest of the year. But you gotta, you gotta take under, under consideration the seasons on that river. And there's basically three seasons. There's winter, winter, fall, uh, spring, and summer. And each season is, is fished a little differently. And the reason why it's fished differently is because the, the river flows on the South Fork fluctuate. It's an irrigation river. So uh, the, that water coming out of Anderson Ranch Dam is for the farmers. So in the spring and, and, and the first part, uh, first half of the summer, uh, that's that high flows. And if you're going to go down there, you have to either go in a boat or be very careful from shore. But once the farmers no longer need uh, the water, they, they, they shut that water off at Anderson Ranch uh, Reservoir. I mean, water's a commodity, and they're just not going to flush it down the canyon for no particular reason. So uh, the South Fork of the Boise River has a, a 300 uh, cubic feet per second uh, minimum flow. So the river will never go down below 300 cubic feet. And right around mid-August, they'll turn that water off and now you're going to be walking back and forth across the river. These fish are now uh, not spread out, but they're all in line uh, and they're very, very easy uh, to nymph fish over and you can access pretty much every location on the river. Uh, so, in essence, if you live in the Treasure Valley, an hour and 15 minutes away, you have one of the finest uh, rainbow trout fisheries in the Northwest 
it's one heck of a nymphing river and uh, if you've been nymphing it for years uh, we want to show you some new stuff uh, certainly maybe some new techniques some new ideas a way to do it if you're if you're uh, new to fly fishing uh, or if you've only been there a couple of times or you're struggling with this thing called nymphing, uh, this is the perfect uh, application for you. We talk about strategies of or techniques in nymph fishing uh, this particular tellwater or any tellwater in particular. Uh, we have to read the water. You know, you just don't walk to this river or any river and 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 just throw your flies out there. Uh, you got to know when to nymph fish. So. In essence, what I'm trying to say is we nymph fish a tailwater river because we can't dry fly fish it. Uh, what drives us to tailwater rivers to begin with is uh, the hatches. Yeah. So this hatch begins every day at 1.30 and you get there at 9, uh, you're going to be nymphing. These fish are, 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 are out there looking out this way. They're not looking like this. There's nothing up there but empty water. There's no reason for them to look up and everything's on the bottom and this is where they're feeding when there's no hatch. So you got to know when to nymph fish. And when we nymph fish uh, Tellwater River is uh, when there's no hatches going on. Uh, now, if we arrive to the river and we don't see any fish rising over it. Now we really have to start reading this water. Now we have to begin to look at it and, and say, okay, where am I going to start fishing? What kind of water am I looking for? And uh, on all Tailwater River, certainly the Tailwater River that we fish, the South Fork of the Boise River, we're looking for certain sections to fly fish. Uh, and what we're really looking for uh, are, are, are basically seams. Uh, we're, trout live on seams. Uh, if there's no seams, there's no trout. And what a seam is, is where fast water and slow water meet. You have very, very fast water and very, very slow water. They're going to live just on the inside of that, that seam. If there's no seams, there's no trout. Uh, and what creates seams are compressions in the water, a curve, a drop in elevation, a turn, uh, a boulder in the river. So we're looking for that at, on, on, on our Tailwater River uh, when we're fly fishing. Uh, pocket water is an ideal place to nymph fish. Uh, pocket water is, is created by boulders, lots of boulders and rocks, uh, uh, maybe some logs in the water, and it slows the water down. Uh, it stops that 10 mile an hour, 15 mile an hour river to a dead stop and then the river goes around that creating those seams uh, and that's where the fish are going to be and we're looking for pocket water we're looking for those seams uh, that are delivered in pocket now a seam is usually uh, referred to as a tail out and a tail out is is that long stretch of water behind a stoppage a tail out can be three feet long what we call a little slick or it can be a hundred yards long uh, but we are working those tail outs and those seams uh, uh, the second thing we're looking for are, uh, are long, big tail outs. And what, a, what will create that is uh, uh, maybe a big, big boulder in the river. And it's just a giant boulder the size of a, you know, a, a four, five cars. And the river just goes around and it creates this long tail out. Or it might be uh, the river is going one direction and it hits a cliff and it has to turn and go that way, it's going to create this long tail out. And where the fish are going to be, they're going to be on those seams along all the way down that tail out. And where the speed of the river from seam to seam is equal, you'll find fish all down that tail out. Uh, we're looking for tail out. We're looking for curves. Curves are great. Uh, curves make a turn, a big long turn or a gentle turn. And what that's going to do is going to shift the water. So it's going to be real shallow here and real deep here. It's going to create that shift and what we call it, we call it in the fishing terms, it's going to move the channel to the far other side of the river. And after billions of years, that, that river's carved out a deep pocket in there. And where you're standing on the inside curve is very shallow. And we want to be fishing these curves because it creates just this tremendously long uh, 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 tail out and if you throw in a couple boulders on there you got some really fishy water or some braids uh, 
And that's what we want to go talk about now, our braids. Braids are really cool. Uh, braids are where the river divides up, and it creates these little uh, channels that it does. And, and, and you'll find trout all in there because there's all kinds of little seams and curves and dips, and the trout will live in there, especially when the water drops. And when the water drops, these trout on the South Fork Boise River, uh, uh, they're going to now go into these little seams, and you're just right there. And you can roll, roll your, 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 your nymphs through there, and, and that's what I'm looking for uh, in Tellwater Rivers. When I see a braid or an island, uh, that's, that's good news for me. Uh, what we don't want to do, on a, on a, on a, or what we don't want to fish or nymph fish on a, on, a, on a Tellwater River is we don't want to fish flat water. Trout don't live in flat water. The flat water is, is wide, flat, shallow, slow moving. Uh, trout will not live in flat water ever. There's, there's no protection from, from things that get them, otters, uh, off spray. Uh, trout don't have sunglasses. They can't get out of the uh, sun. There's no place to get out of the sun. There's no depth. There's no place to hide. And there's really no food in there because food just sinks to the bottom. Uh, where fish need to be are in fast moving water. Uh, that's where there's some, uh, the mirror's broken, there's depth, uh, food's coming at them, there's oxygen. So uh, if you are fishing flat water on a tailwater river, then you're just burning time. So we have to be able to read this river correctly. Uh, uh, fish are very keyed in uh, on, on nymphs when there's no hatches. Uh, you're looking for seams, you're looking for pocket water, curves, tail outs, uh, inside curves. Uh, uh, we're looking for uh, changes it in, in, the, in the bottom of the river where it dips and the, and, and uh, our local tailwater the South Fort Boise River uh, has a lot of these and you're constantly reading the water so on on, on, on tailwater rivers they can get they're very popular uh, they have giant trout in them and you can get uh, uh, you can get there, and there's a lot of people there, and they're there for the same reason you are. But when you have a river like 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 the uh, Tellwater River, and it has a lot of these these things in the river, you're going to have a lot of river to fish. So uh, start reading the water. Come up with a strategy. If if the river is if the river's 10 miles long, uh, don't get there at mile and one. Start fishing. Drive the whole 10 miles. View the whole river. See it. Lock it in your memory. Turn around. Okay, we're standing right here on Danskin Bridge, uh, looking upstream. And behind me, you're going to see a classic South Fork Boise River tailout. This is where trout love to be. Uh, they get, they work the inside seams. You can work the middle seam. At some point, the speed of the river is going to be equal across, and you'll find fish all in there. Pocket water is, it's just what it sounds like, or it is. It's pocket water. Here's a good stretch of water. That's illustrates what I'm trying to say. There's a lot of. Uh, boulders and rocks and the fish love this they'll hang in those areas pocket water is the place I want to be uh, uh, fish will not like being out in flat water they love that pocket water they can hide the food comes there they don't swim for it they get behind a rock underwater and I, those are the areas uh, I choose to nymph uh, when I'm nymphing and uh, uh, when you're when you're going down the Boise River and you're and you're or excuse me the South Fork Boise River and you're looking and reading the water. When you see pocket water like I see behind me, then that's the place I want to pull over and stop and try that right, right quick. We're still downstream uh, from Cow Creek Bridge, and uh, what you see down the river is uh, what we call an inside curve compression. Uh, the river's going to make a right-hand turn, and that's going to change the channel of the river to the far uh, bank from us, and, and also on the inside of that, that uh, channel, it's going to create an eddy downstream. From a st strategic standpoint, uh, nymph fishing a tailwater river is not, they're not complicated. Strategies are, are quite simple. Uh, you form one and then you go do it. And, and the best way to start a strategy is from the road. Uh, most tailwater rivers uh, you can access by road. Uh, uh, other tailwater rivers, you're in a boat and you're just flying by. There's really no strategy when you're in a drift boat. You throw it out there and off you go. Uh, but when you're fishing from shore or you're in a vehicle, you, you usually have a length of river that you're, you're, you can actually view and, 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 and fish. Your strategy changes from section one where you started fishing to section two where you want to maybe fish. Uh, it changes all the time. And that strategy is first formed uh, from the vehicle. 
Uh, you're looking for water, and that's that 10-mile stretch I talked about. Drive the length of the river. You're formulating a strategy as you go. You haven't even got out of the car or truck yet, and you're formulating. Oh, yeah, that's a section right there I want to fish. You're beginning to formulate it. And then when you, when you come back or you find a section that you really that meets your criteria for good, solid nymph fishing, you know, you get, get out of your car and, and, and be, start that strategy uh, before you even go down to the river. Now you have something to go by. You just don't want to go down the river and go, but, you know, how am I going to do this? Uh, no, you got to have a strategy. And that strategy begins there, and then it begins when you get on the river. So when we're talking about uh, strategies and, and, and how you approach a river in general, you really want to approach it uh, wherever you're fishing. For example, if you're working a tail out, uh, you want to be downstream from that tail out. So if that tail out is between zero and uh, uh, 40 yards, you want to start fishing that at 40 yards. You don't want to walk up to the top and start fishing it. Uh, there's nothing scarier on God's earth than a non-feeding trout. Odds are, if you start at the top and start fishing it at, at zero yards, uh, you've already scared those fish before you got there. Uh, and as you start working down, you know, five yards, ten yards, you're working down, you've already scared all those fish. Uh, if you're lucky enough, and it happens all the time, but if you're lucky enough, uh, you can't start from the bottom to the top. You have to start at the top because it's too, too dangerous or the river's not going to allow you to start from the bottom. If you catch a fish at the top, the science of this is, uh, that fish is going to go down, straight down that, that, that uh, 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 tail out, and it's going to spook a lot of fish in there, uh, as well as see you. Sometimes it, it, those fish will see you before you even approach. Uh, it's not so much you they see as your movement. Uh, by working downstream from these trout, you're actually behind them where they can't see you. Uh, and that can allow you to really work from those fish down, from those fish down. And then after you've worked that section of the river, these fish don't even know you're there. Then you can move up, shorten your cast, uh, make them more uh, 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 accurate and, and, a, and a lot easier cast to work if you're nymphing by, by moving up and, and, and attacking these fish that can't see you. Uh, if you do catch a fish, uh, it will go down and scare a fish that's already you've already scared. So the, the, when we talk about strategies, is, is whatever possible, you always want to try to work from the bottom to the top. Uh, now, if you particularly have a, 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 a section of river that looks really fishy to you for nymphing, uh, then you got to look at that river and you have to read it again because, you know, as you know, fish live on seams. And you just don't want to walk out in that river and start plopping your, your fly down. Uh, uh, what we really want to do is, before we even get on the water, uh, is we really want to work the water in front of us. There could be a lot of trout laying there and, and really keep, keep that cache so short and sweet. So we want to nymph fish our way out into the river uh, or into a section of the river where we want to be. And then we want to really start working uh, that inside seam and really working it, working it, working it. So you always work the inside seam. So when we're talking about a tail out, there's two seams. You know, you have this obstruction here and the river's going through, they're working those two seams and you're over here, uh, you're working this one seam. And you really want to work that before you go out and start working the back seam or down the middle. You always work from the inside out. So you really want to work that water in front of you. You want to, uh, each, each uh, location is a different strategy. You always try to be uh, at the very bottom or downstream from the fish. Uh, you always want to be in an area of uh, fly fishing where, where you're not going to scare the fish. Uh, if you do scare fish, it'll be in front of you and downstream from you, but not ahead of you. If you keep these kind of uh, uh, standard strategic principles in fly fishing, uh, you know, you're, you're, at the end of the day, you're going to catch more fish than you would if you had started just nilly willy out there. So keep that in mind. Look at the water from the road. View where you're going to fish. Form a strategy and then fish that strategy. All right, we get at the road. We 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 have a good strategy. Uh, we have a great piece of water. It may be it may be water that you've never fished before, or maybe your favorite section of, of the river. But you have at least some sort of strategy. Now we have to look at techniques, and 
I, I believe that fly fishing has changed tremendously in the last 10 years, uh, last 10 or 15 years. Uh, the way we're fishing in these last decade or so is not how we were doing it five or 10 years ago. Uh, nowhere in fly fishing has anything changed more than nymphing. It's an incredible thing, uh, this, this nymphing we're doing nowadays. Uh, and you can, uh, uh, it can basically be attributed to kind of the international fly fishing uh, championships that, that, that our, our international fly fishing team has been involved in and the Euro has been involved in, but there's been a Euro huge European influx into how we're nymphing now. Uh, certainly, uh, there's a, <laughs> I mean, where do you begin with fly rods? I mean, uh, there's any, every kind of, any kind of nymphing fly rod you can imagine out there now, uh, or 10 years ago, there was one. Uh, so. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about techniques with that in mind. Uh, we're talking about what way anglers are, are, are nymphing today in the modern sense of the term nymphing. And there's basically three different approaches uh, in nymphing. Uh, one is uh, uh, the classic approach. The other is the Euro approach. And the other is really drop shot nymphing. Uh, what they have in common are basically the cast is the same. But here's the key that you need to understand is your flies have to be on the bottom. It has to be on the bottom. There's there's a good 15, 20 different types of, of nymphing techniques out there today. Even so much so that we're calling it bastard nymphing in the sense that we're stealing things and creating your own way of doing it. Uh, but what they all have in common is the flies have to be on the bottom and the cast is basically the same. So I've broken it down for simplicity reasons for you. Uh, and into three categories. Classic, which most of us are familiar with, and I want to talk about, about that, and Euro. What is this Euro? What's what's Euro style? What's what's uh, Czech nymphing and Polish nymphing and French nymphing and Spanish nymphing and Planet Mars nymphing? Uh, uh, all these European uh, uh, techniques and, and just Euro in general. Uh, and then uh, I want to talk to you about an exciting new drop shot nymphing. That, that, that's an American style of nymphing that many of us are doing now. Certainly I am. So let's start with uh, the classic form of nymphing. And I've made up these little leaders here for you. And as I told you, what really separates these different forms of nymphing are the leaders they're using. So classic is, is very familiar. Uh, it's simply, I mean, we were doing it as kids. We tied on a hook and then we put a worm on it and then we put some split shot on it and we threw it out in the lake or the pond or the river and fish would come along and eat it. The classic is a classic form of nymphing is very much like that and we're instead of tying on a worm we're tying on a nymph, uh, an aquatic insect that we've imitated with fur and feathers on one end and, and we put a split shot here just like a worm and we throw it out in the river uh, and fish come along and eat that. Uh, but we, we can put a strike indicator on that. So now that we have this going on. So that's more uh, of a classic form of nymphing that we're all familiar with in some way, shape, or form. Uh, nymphing is probably this, the easiest form of uh, fly fishing there is. And it's as simple as putting a worm on a hook, basically, so that we're using fur and feathers. Uh, and that's essentially the, uh, the ease of classic nymphing. Uh, we even can add another fly off the bend of the hook, and we can fish multiple flies that way. The disadvantage of, of classic nymphing is all these, this hook, this lead, and all these flies are all on the bottom. And you get hung up a lot, and you lose a lot of flies. So that kind of gives you an idea of, of classic nymphing. Uh, much of what uh, anglers today are doing is they're, they're going Euro style. And what Euro style is, is something like this. Uh, there we go. Yeah. It's like this. I don't know if you can see that totally. But what we have going on here is what they're tying on is at the end of their leader, they're tying on a fly. Just right at the end. Just like classic nymphing. They're tying a fly on. And they're right about, I don't know, it it's varies from leader to leader. I'll shorten this a little bit. There's the, the loop. Uh, then they have what we call a an anchor fly, and that's what this is. At about 12 or 15, anywhere from 12 to 18 inches, uh, they have now the Europeans have a anchor fly, and this fly right here is coming through the water, off the bottom, but they call this an anchor fly because it's a heavy fly down here, and that's on the bottom, 
And what we've done, what the urals have done, is they've even put another one right here. So they have two flies off the bottom and one on the bottom. And what classic ural and drop shot will make it modern is, is today we're actually moving these flies through the water slightly faster than the current versus just throwing them out in there and letting them drift through. Uh, as you can see, these are all adjustable and you can change flies by simply uh, adding new ones on and sliding them down. Uh, what drop shot does is drop shot nymphing is a little different than that in that it has uh, two flies and how we put these flies on are we just simply make a loop and, uh, and we tie the fly on the end of there and then we just take our fly and when we add a fly we just take it around and we take fly to loop and then we just slide it down to a knot in our, in our, on our leader and we're fishing two flies or even three flies. But the difference is there's a lead's at the very end and the lead is what's on the bottom. So in essence you're having a drift like this. So we have two flies or three flies. Uh, you may even have an inline fly but all your flies are off the bottom and the only thing on the bottom is the lead. And if you get caught on the bottom uh, it's generally the lead, not the flies, and the lead will just slide off. Uh, that's the three different styles. Uh, again, as you can do your homework and you can look at the different styles and, and what really separates Polish nymphing from Czech nymphing and from French nymphing and, and Spanish nymphing is really how they have their leaders. Uh, what separates drop shot nymphing from all those Euro styles is how we have our leaders and what separates classic from Euro and drop shot is how we have their leaders. What makes it modern is the technique that we use once the flies go in the water we're pulling it through. So when we're at the roadside and we're uh, uh, looking from our stretch strategic tent standpoint, we have a te technique down that we're already going to use. Uh, if you're uh, a hardcore nymph fisherman now, you have a technique that you like to use, this is a no-brainer. Uh, if you are uh, been dabbling in different techniques, uh, you need to zero in on, on a certain way of doing it and really get good at that. Uh, each technique has its advantages and disadvantages. This is certainly not the, the place for me to uh, teach you a certain technique in, in nymphing, uh, but the advice that I would give you is start doing some learning. Start understanding what these different techniques are uh, and go from there. If, you, if you're good at one of them, then you're automatically good with all of them. So pick one, like drop shot. If you pick drop shot, get really good at it, and by default, you're already good at Euro. You're already good at classic. You're already good at, at high sticking. You're already good at short line. You're already good at strike indicator and everything. So get good at one and transfer those around and, and, and use those techniques. They all work from a strategic standpoint on a tailwater river. Uh, unique to the South Fork of the Boise River are certain hatches that happen there. What I mean by hatches is the insects that live in that river. Some of those are, 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 a few of those are very homogeneous to that river, or there's only a few rivers that have these, these aquatic insects. So whether, whether or not we are nymph fishing or we're dry fly fishing, we first have to understand uh, what these fish are eating on. So uh, uh, 95 to 100, 95 to 98 percent of what a trout eats uh, uh, in any river are aquatic insects. Uh, if, you, if you ever catch a trout and you pump its stomach, uh, like I do quite often, and you put the contents in a dish and you look at it, uh, let the fish go, uh, in, that, in that dish you're going to see nothing but aquatic insects. It's rare that I see an ant in there, uh, or a grasshopper even. Uh, most of what I see in there, 90 plus percent of what I see in that dish, are aquatic insects. That's what trout feed on. And in today's modern nymphing, we need to be a little more accurate, a little bit understanding what these fish are eating. So when we talk about the South Fork of the Boise River, uh, that's a, 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 an incredible river in the sense that there's five or six, seven uh, varieties of stoneflies in that river. And these stoneflies in there, they get quite large. Uh, you know, a, 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 a salmon fly, stonefly, is huge. And uh, when they emerge, they crawl out of the river, and uh, these fish key in on them. I mean, that's, that's a beef chunk of beef steak floating down the river. And they'll gorge themselves on the nymphs. Uh, 
but it's that way with all the stoneflies. Uh, there's golden stones, there's brown stones, there's uh, swallows. Um, there, there's just a number of stoneflies that live in that. It's a stonefly heaven in that river. Uh, you need to get familiar with stoneflies because when we're nymphing, that's going to be your lead fly. Uh, big fish eat these stoneflies. They know what a stonefly is. And, and present it correctly, uh, it's hard for a, a hungry fish to pass up a good beef chunk of beef floating down. They'll take it. Uh, I can tell you that the biggest fish that I've ever caught year in, year out, uh, while I'm nymphing there, have been on the stonefly nymphs. So that's something you really need to, to uh, reconsider and to check your fly box for because we need to look at that. Uh, the second thing is, is on that river is we have a tremendous caddis hatch and a tremendous uh, 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 mayfly hatch. Uh, so we need to talk about that in particular. Uh, the first mayfly on the water, believe it or not, is a March brown. And we usually can't fish that because that's uh, usually during the early parts of May. Uh, but we will drift into that as the season opens, uh, and the water's pretty high. And uh, uh, basically, a good imitation for a March brown would be uh, a pheasant tail uh, and, and nymph down behind a stonefly. Uh, next thing we need to worry about is, is the blowing olive. Uh, this is a minor um, uh, uh, mayfly for that river that this time. I mean, there's a lot of high water, there's a lot going on in that river, but, but the, the blowing olives uh, in the river are a key resource in the early spring, winter, and fall. Uh, not so much during the summer and, and the late spring when the season opens. So when you're put when you're when you're put in the driver's seat on the South Fork uh, in the in the summer when it opens uh, around June, uh, the the blue-winged olive is a minor hatch, uh, and you're going to see the PMDs come. Uh, they're going to be in the afternoon. Uh, and that's something you need to keep an eye on because fish are keen on those. You'll find some cicadas, and we're beginning the caddis hatch. Caddis hatch is going to run all the way through from. Uh, uh, the, the season opener all the way to end of October. You're going to find caddis, and usually you're going to find caddis late in the afternoon or, or right around sunset. Uh, by far the most dominant mayfly uh, on the South Fork Boise River is, is the pink albert or Eporius albertus. That's really critical for you. That's the dominant mayfly hatch. Uh, that's what these fish are keying in. That's at the peak of its emergence when they lower the river down to 300 cubic feet. Uh, the minute that they drop that river and you can access that river, it's right in the middle of the pink albert hatch. Trust me, these, these fish know what a pink albert is. And it's an uncomplicated hatch. And when there's no uh, hatch going on in particular, then you want to make sure that you have a, a, a nymph that mimics what the real nymph looks like uh, uh, when you're nymph fishing. Uh, we go right in to the blue-winged olive again in the fall, uh, uh, late, late summer, early fall. Uh, this blowing olive is going to be a really small size 20 blowing olive, so you're, you're going to need that. So you've got a lot going on in the, in the late spring, I mean late summer, early fall. You have a lot going on. The river has opened up for you. Uh, the insect hatches are incredible at this point. You have the, uh, you still have PMDs all summer long. In the late afternoon you have pink alberts. you got the blue winged olives coming on. And you have a caddis hatch. And all these are moving nymphs. All these are nymphs that are mature on the bottom. And the fish will gorge themselves during hatches on these nymphs. Uh, and really, the final two uh, uh, summertime hatches or fall hatches are, 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 are the mahogany dun uh, mayfly and the flab mayfly. And you'll see those uh, towards the end. Uh, and then as you move into uh, uh, fall again, uh, we're right back into the midges. So midges are something that the fish will eat all fall, all winter, and into spring. And if you're going to successfully uh, fish that river, uh, you have to have a, a large selection of midges. Uh, I will nymph fish midges all winter. I will nymph fish midges all spring. And I will nymph fish midges all, all summer long. So when we look at the the cross-section of the river in terms of what insects are on the river. Uh, a good hatch chart is something that you should go by. It's going to tell you what's moving in the river. Uh, these aquatic insects have to hatch, so that's called movement in the water. That's when things are in the water. 
uh, and it keys fish into these things. They're used to seeing them on the bottom. You want to match what you're doing on the bottom of the river with the correct nymph that, that, that time of the year. This is not how we're nymphing in the 1980s and 90s. Today, modern nymphing is we're getting more and more accurate with the nymphs we're using on the bottom. And it's that's the cutting edge fly fishing right now. We're no longer using just a, a generic hair, a beadhead hair's ear. Uh, now we're really, that beadhead hair's ear is still very, very effective, but we're really going more towards uh, uh, trying to imitate what that uh, uh, aquatic insect is that's on the movement right now. We, we briefly talked about the hatches that, that go on these Tellwater Rivers. Um, and now we need to talk a little bit about flies. There's a little bit of overlap there, but in general, uh, there's, there's basically five categories, uh, four categories really, of flies that you're using and you're just switching, trying to find that magic fly. Meaning when fishing's really good, <laughs> you don't need to switch flies. But when things slow down a little bit and you've been nymphing a while and maybe a couple sections, uh, uh, don't be afraid to change flies. So we talked about the value of stoneflies in some of our western uh, tailwater rivers. Uh, so a stonefly is, again, it's a big nymph. Uh, and there, there's a ton of different patterns out there. Uh, some of the old true style patterns work great even today. Uh, a lot of tires now, if you get on YouTube and, and you look at some of these uh, flies that were really uh, that guys are tying now, you'll start to understand what I'm trying to say where, where uh, nothing has changed more than nymph fishing in, in the last 10 or 15 years in, in fly fishing. And, and, and when you look at some of these new flies coming out, I mean, they look just like the real thing. Uh, so stoneflies uh, are certainly one that you should have. You should have a variety of different patterns and sizes. Um, so you know, from there, you have to go to the caddis and start thinking about caddis pupa and, 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 and uh, the caddis larva itself, especially when we're having an evening caddis hatch all, all summer long. Uh, caddis are, are moving in the water. Uh, and that's something that you should be nymphing. If we, if I say to you, 45 plus percent of what a trout eats during the season are caddisflies, uh, you should be fishing caddisflies, uh, uh, and then mayflies. Uh, mayflies uh, are take up the other 40 to 45 percent. And again, uh, we have various, various uh, species of mayflies that that might be uh, living in in, a, in, a, in in our river, and. Uh, and each one is, 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 is hatching or, or emerging at certain times of the year and certain times during the summer you may have multiple uh, hatches going on, one in the morning, one in the afternoon, one in the evening. Uh, you need to be able to move those, those uh, 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 or change those mayflies. Uh, so basically, uh, again, we're talking about this modern way now, of, uh, and YouTube is a classic example. Uh, the old nymphs are still working and you can still use those. Uh, and you can use those old nymphs like the hare's ear and the, and the pheasant tails with extreme success. Uh, but again, don't, don't, don't pass up some of these modern uh, uh, realistic style of, of nymphs that are coming out. Uh, and then uh, a more uh, modern uh, uh, nymph that we're using now is called a Frenchie. And that's, <laughs> it's I guess from France, <laughs> but uh, Guys are using these little Frenchies, and they're really, really simple nymphs. And, and, and you'll get a, a, a photograph of that. Uh, they're so simple that you say to me, well, what makes these better than, and what makes these things so good? I mean, it's just a bead with a bunch of stuff on the hook. Uh, now, I don't know, but it's working, and <laughs> I'd recommend that you have at least a few of them to try. And last but not least, and I, and I mean this uh, uh, in the reverse, this shouldn't be least, and it shouldn't be last, but uh, uh, all, all rivers have... Uh, a, a huge population of midges in it, midges, uh, cranamid midges, uh, and you have to have uh, lots of those, and, and, and the sizes uh, uh, accordingly would be anywhere from a size 22 all the way down to a size uh, 18 or even 16, and, and I'm, I'm actually, uh, I will, I will uh, nip fish midges all year long, uh, all through summer. Uh, there's in some rivers uh, in the west here. Uh, I, can, I can think of the Wahi River in, in uh, uh, western Idaho, eastern Montana. Uh, excuse me, eastern uh, Oregon. Uh, the Wahi River has over 28,000 aquatic insects per square meter, 
and I would venture to say that probably 85% of those are midges. So there's an extraordinary amount of midges in rivers, and it's something that you should be nymphing with, certainly all fall, winter, and spring, and into summer too. So those are basically five groups of, of nymphs that you need to have, uh, and you need to have them in quantity. So uh, when you look at your flies, uh, you want to look at it from that point of view. You want to make sure you have lots of different patterns and sizes of those different types of categories. And then don't be afraid to change flies if things are slow on the river. You know, as owner of a, a fly fishing school and a teacher of fly fishing the last 30 or more years, I get a lot of questions in fly fishing. And, and, and in nymph fishing itself, uh, I think the more questions are generated by the gear than by the strategy or technique. And you would think it would be the opposite. You would think that strategy and technique would be the questions that I get the most. But really, it's the gear. And a lot of people are confused today by gear. I think I mentioned a little bit earlier in the video about uh, how r rods have changed so much in nymph fishing. You know, you have these Euro rods, they have, you know, three weight, four weight, five weight tips, and six weight butts, and and they're 10 feet long, and how do I know which rod's for me? Well, that's part of what I was telling you about how far nymphing has changed. Uh, the general nymphing rod uh, for a century has been, starting with bamboo till recently, has been a, a, a nine foot, uh, eight and a half foot, nine foot, uh, six weight rod, and then it became a, a, a nine foot, six weight rod. Uh, so rods confuse a lot of people. And uh, so I'm here to kind of clear up that a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to get into uh, matching your rod to your style. Uh, I will give you more of a generic uh, uh, nymphing rod that we are using today that will pretty much do everything for you. Uh, and you don't need to spend a lot of money on, on, a, on a nymphing rod. Uh, fly fishing is two things. It's dry fly fishing and nymphing. Uh, and that's what really fly fishing is. And nowhere has, has fly fishing changed more than in the fly rods. Uh, fly rods have gone linear now. This rod's designed to do this, this one's designed to do that, this one's designed to do this, this is drop shotting, this is uh, year old, I have a three weight tip, this one's for perch, steelhead, this one's for that, this is a perfect rod for this, that, and lake gear. And, you know, back in the day, it was one rod did everything, not today. And, and, and to, to kind of give you a, 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 a more of unconfused uh, a, a view of this, uh, if fly fishing's uh, 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 subsurface and surface, or it's dry fly fishing and nymphing, you should have a minimum of two rods. Uh, you shouldn't have, you shouldn't use your dry fly rod to nymph with. You shouldn't use your nymph rod to dry fly fish. That's like, that, that's, that's like taking your putter and using it as a driver, and your driver using it as a putter. That's how far rods have come today. Uh, can they do both? Yeah. Uh, but they're really designed for either surface or subsurface. So when we talk about the, the, the generically uh, proper uh, nymph rod that you should have, is not much has changed uh, from that general purpose of a, of a nymph rod. I will tell you this, uh, and most uh, solid nymph fishermen would, would, would agree with me on this, is nymph rods today should be uh, a 10-foot rod. It should be a 10-foot and it should be a six-weight. Now, that's going to cover everything. You can drop shot, you can Euro style, you can classic nymph, but it's really that extra uh, 12 inches that you're adding in length. And what that's doing is it's giving you an extra 12 inches in your cast, that power. It's giving you an extra 12 inches for length, and it's going to make nymph fishing a little bit easier for you. However, I'm not... I'm not saying that you should go out and buy a new rod. I'm saying that if you have a nine foot six weight, you know, you don't need to do this. You can do everything with that nine foot six weight. But I think uh, uh, as a universal rod that will do everything, uh, uh, a 10 foot six weight would, would cross all borders. Reels, uh, uh, you know, I'm not a big guy on reels. Uh, whatever reel you have, uh, typically a four or five reel. So if you know anything about reels, reels are numbered by how, how big around they are and how small they are. So the smaller number, like a three, four, would be a very small reel. A four or five would be just a little bit bigger. Most nymphing can be done with a four or five reel. Uh, and reels are really kind of insignificant in any style of nymphing. Uh, a very, very important tool for you to have on the river are sunglasses. Don't skip on, on price. 
get yourself a very good pair of of polarized sunglasses it can really make life easy for you while you're waiting uh, certainly you need to start considering putting some sort of aluminum uh, cleats on the bottom of your of your of your uh, boots, your wading boots. If you don't use wading boots, if you wade wet, then you can get uh, uh, those same things that you can actually apply to your wading sandals. Uh, and don't use sink tip line. Sink tip is 80 feet of floating line and 10 feet of sink tip. Sink tip, all it does is drag and, and it's just, it's useless for you. Uh, you want to use regular old floating line, put your leader on that and go at it. Uh, Lead, we ha if you're using classic style of nymphing or drop shot style of nymphing, uh, you're going to need some lead split shot. Uh, if you're Euro style, uh, the lead or the weights in the, in the anchor fly. Uh, and a good standard for you to start with are two sizes. One is called a, a size BB, like the size of a BB and a BB gun. And the next size up for that is what we call 3 ot or 3 o. Uh, that's really a good starting point. You can take lead off and on. You should have removable lead. And a good pair of needle nose pliers. Uh, many rivers in the West, uh, you have regulations in the rivers. You can't use hooks with barbs. And I know from my own experience that I've tried to debarb a hook with my forceps and I can't do it. Uh, if you have a good pair of forceps, a really expensive, heavy duty pair of forceps, it, it, it can do it. But buying a you know a two dollar pair of, of needle nose uh, will actually bend those barbs down. And if you're drop shotting, it's gonna allow you to really flatten that lead at the very end. You want your lead flat instead of chunked. And then uh, uh, last but not least, uh, a good technique is certainly not required. It certainly doesn't help you catch fish, but it is something that I use, and I would uh, recommend that you kind of look into it. Uh, carry a stomach pump on you. Uh, stomach pumps done correctly uh, won't even bother the fish. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is a stomach pump done wrong can kill a fish. Uh, uh, it's easy, easy to learn how to pump a trout stomach correctly. Step one, don't watch YouTube. <laughs> Step two, read the directions. Uh, but what a stomach pump does is allows you to remove the contents of, of the stomach of the, of the fly, I mean of the fish, uh, without disturbing or hurting it. Uh, and then you can now see that what that fish has been eating on from a content standpoint. All these things are, 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 are gear orientated. Uh, I would say that this is a good list for you to start by. And, uh, and, and, and the rod would be your probably most important tool that you buy. And then the incidental things along the way will certainly get you on the river and certainly get you uh, on a tailwater river with the right tools necessary to catch fish. You know, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to nymph fish the South Fork Boise River for a long time. Uh, that river has really become pretty special to me to the point where if I die, burn me up, put my ashes in a coffee can and kick me off the bridge at Cow Creek Creek, Cow Creek Bridge. I love that river. It's everything for a fly fisherman. Certainly uh, a great nymphing river for large trout. Uh, it can be rewarding to you as it is to me. Uh, it's right in your backyard. It's close to home. Uh, I, I love to take my wife there with me and, and we picnic. We have a favorite tree uh, in the shade overlooking my favorite place to fish in the river. Let's just set up our chairs and, and, and me and my waiters and we'll have a gourmet lunch and we'll just sit there for hours and, uh, and just enjoy the river. Uh, it's that kind of river. It's, it's a really special place in my heart and it can be in your heart too. It certainly didn't begin that way with me but it can be with you. Uh, I've hoped to give you uh, a, a good heads up on some of the, the strategies and techniques of working this river and being successful. Uh, I wish that when I started uh, nymphing that river uh, uh, that I had someone that could have at least given me a heads up. Most of the stuff I'm teaching you or showing you today in this video are things I had to learn a hard way. And, and the things that I'm telling you and, and, and I'm showing you in this video, uh, these are what were brought down to me by other guys like me. Uh, uh, so if you're a skilled angler or you've been nymphing the river, I hope you've been able to pick out a few things uh, that's going to make you better. Uh, if you've been 
bumbling around trying to nymph fish the river, uh, uh, what I've tried to do is really center you and giving you a, a, a little foundation and gathering you up and say, okay, now do it. Uh, if you're new to the area or new to fly fishing, uh, this, this is a perfect video in the sense that's going to introduce these things to you. But by and by, uh, the South Fork of the Boise River is a really, really special place for you. It is for me, and it will continue to be for me and my kids and my grandchildren after I'm gone.